Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning and welcome to our weekly Wednesday class. Today's class is on fall vegetable gardening. My name is Thomas Bowles. I will be presenting. Christina Hastings, Jan Rice, and Natalie Walker will be helping with the chat. Virginia Cooperative Extension is a partnership between Virginia State and Virginia Tech. Our mission is to provide unbiased research-based information to the public. Here in Prince William County, we offer educational programming in parenting, financial education, nutrition, youth development through 4-H, and environmental and natural resources, which covers agriculture, home gardening, stormwater, and other issues. There are many challenges to growing vegetables in the fall. One of those challenges is that our planting dates are not ideal for the situation. A lot of our planting dates are when it's still hot in late summer, and so we can mitigate this by starting seeds indoors where the temperature is easier to control, or we can purchase starts from a nursery or a garden center. Another issue that we run into are early freezes and frosts. While we have an idea of when the average early killing frost is, it can vary from year to year. And so using season extenders is a way to help protect our plants and ensure that we get a crop in on time. Another potential issue is that availability may be limited. And we can work around that by ordering seeds and starts online. We can work and plan with our local garden center to make sure they have in stock the plants that we want or we can just buy seed in late winter early spring and save that for the following fall another challenge is the shorter season we don't have as much time we don't have as much light and so we can mitigate that some by using short season varieties using row covers to extend that season warmth wise and growing some plants for greens instead of for their roots like carrots or beets. Undersowing is a technique we use with crops that are best direct seeded. And this is a technique where you basically are tossing seeds underneath a standing crop. This allows the winter crop to get a head start while the summer crop is finishing up. The picture on the right has mammoth sunflowers. It says overseeded, but it was really undersown with cereal rye and crimson clover. Crimson clover needs a state of maturity in order to be able to survive the winter in our climate. And so by undersowing, we gave the cover crop a jump start so that when we cut those sunflowers down, our cover crop was already established and up and going. If you want to undersow, and still have a neat appearance. Instead of just broadcasting seed, you can use seed tape. Seed tape is available commercially or you can make seed tape yourself. At the end, there's a resource from our Florida Extension partners on how to do that. It's very easy. And again, for those of you who are a little bit more orderly in your garden, it creates a much nicer appearance. We often think about orienting our gardening so that as many plants as possible get full and direct sun. However, we can reverse that orientation and use taller plants to shade fall crops while they're still in the field in the summer. And so, for example, if the corn growing, if we had reversed this picture, the corn would be shading the radishes and the broccoli and allow them to develop so that they have a longer growing season. Shade cloth is another way to get our cool season plants at a little cooler temperature, even though we've started them when it's hot. And shade cloth comes in a variety of light blocking percentages. Shade cloth is useful either in low tunnels, high tunnels, or in greenhouses. Row covers are something we can use to extend the season. Row covers are light cloth that allow water and light to penetrate. They provide a little bit of frost protection. They can be installed really easily. It doesn't take a whole lot. 
They are also useful in excluding insect pests, and for some of our brassicas that can be a major issue. Low tunnels or coal frames are usually cloth or plastic, or in the case of coal frames, glass, that are over the plants. And these are low to the ground. They're usually no more than waist high, occasionally chest high. They're good for frost protection. They're good for excluding insect pests. But they may have issues with snow loads, depending on how space the supports are. Blue things in the background are columns of water that are in a mat and they're circling plants. I believe in this case it's peppers. The idea is when a frost hits it's going to take so much energy to freeze the water that's in there. By the time that cold energy reaches the plant it'll be warm enough so that there won't be any frost damage. A high tunnel is basically a low tunnel that you can walk in. High tunnels typically are plastic covered. The basic ventilation system they have are doors on either end, which makes it a little harder to moderate temperature during the day. They're unheated at night, which also makes it a little harder to have temperature control. They need to be built sturdy enough to handle both snow and wind. Greenhouses are basically high tunnels that are built a little bit more permanently. They also have ventilation systems and heating systems. That climate control is great, but it does take a lot of cost in terms of running the electricity and that heat. The upfront construction costs are pretty expensive. And depending on what you're growing, you may still need to have supplemental lighting. Generally speaking, I don't recommend greenhouses for beginners and I don't recommend greenhouses for homeowners. It's, they're great for production but a lot of times they're not worth the cost if you're a homeowner. Still there are some home growers that are advanced enough where they can handle running a greenhouse and if you have questions about greenhouses or whether you should use a greenhouse let me know and I'm happy to answer those questions. Just because you don't have a greenhouse doesn't mean you can't grow indoors. Sunrooms or even a nice space in the basement with appropriate lighting can be ideal to grow things not only in the fall but into the winter. Temperature control and light are key. There are a lot of newer full spectrum LED lights that are relatively inexpensive and very long lasting. One thing to keep in mind is that the weaker the light and the farther away that light is from the plants, the layer the plants can get, and that's not what you really want. The easiest thing for indoors is either starting seeds or growing leafy greens. They'll respond best, but you can grow other plants in these situations. So the next question you need to think about after you've figured out, well, what are the challenges and how might I overcome them, is what can you grow? And the place to start is the average killing frost of your location. Here in Prince William County, we're a long county, so we have different average killing frost dates. Uh, it's October 19th, closer to Bull Run Mountain, and then closer to the bay, you're looking at almost Halloween. So then you kind of backtrack where you are in the calendar as to what you can grow either from seed or from start. Think about your season extenders. This chart up here is from our master gardener Paul Gibson who made this chart for us. Um, this is based on Virginia Tech publications. If you're in Northern Virginia this chart will work for you. Email us. We're happy to send it out to you. This particular version of the chart just has our cool season crops. Basically, you're looking at onions, you're looking at cabbages and other members of the brassica family, lettuces, things like that. If we look at this in a more graphically pleasing or eye-pleasing manner, basically you're looking at members of the onion family, brassicas, various herbs, chinopods, lettuces, and then a few other hangers-on. 
regardless of what plant that you're considering, it's important that you do your research. Know how long it takes to reach maturity. Know how cold hardy it is. And that's going to influence your planting dates and what kind of season extenders, if any, you're going to need. If all else fails, you can plant cover crops. That will help keep your soil working over the winter. And it will help your biology, which will make for healthier soil and healthier plants in the spring. Cover crops is a whole class by itself, and I can talk for hours on cover crops. If you have questions about cover crops, please email me. I'm happy to discuss your individual circumstances and make some recommendations on what may or may not work for you. There are several members of the onion family that are good in the fall. They're best grown from starts. Growing them from seed is usually a lot of hassle. It's much easier to get starts. Bunching onions like scallions, they're basically perennials, although when we harvest them, we treat them like annuals. They're not very tolerant of frozen ground. They need to be covered or brought inside or use black mulch cloth to help keep that heat and help to keep the ground from freezing. Bulb onions need about 10 hours of sun to really start forming bulbs, so that's something to keep in mind. When they're planted in the fall, you're going to have smaller bulbs. Generally speaking, you're looking about 80 plus days to maturity, and the seedlings are hardy to about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Garlic is a good choice for the fall. In Northern Virginia, you're talking about planting the cloves from late September into October. You're going to mulch them with straw and harvest them in June. Now, there are hard and soft neck varieties, and most of that's a matter of taste. Most of what you get in the grocery store are soft necks. Now, I get asked a lot, can I use garlic from the store as a start? I recommend, if you're going to try and do that, that you start with organic garlic. Most vegetables capable of sprouting in long-term storage are treated with hormones to retard that. That is not considered an organic practice, and so organic vegetables don't have that and sprout more readily. And you find that's true with potatoes, sweet potatoes, and with garlic and onions. Most brassicas are cool season plants, and so we can grow them in both spring and fall. And there are lots of different brassicas to choose from. Most of them can handle a frost, but not all of them can handle hard freezes. Row covers are very helpful for both insulating and reducing pests. Generally speaking, if you're looking for starts, you're more likely to find a brassica than anything else. There are a number of annual herbs you can grow. Cilantro and parsley do really well. Basil and dill will do well until you start getting frost. Also, there are a number of perennial herbs like rosemary that do well in cold weather. There are a few chinopods you can grow in cool season conditions. Beets, which are sown directly. They can be harvested for their greens or they can be harvested for their roots. Spinach is another good chinopod. Typically this gets sown in August, September. The germination is going to vary based on temperature. And sometimes it's better to start spinach indoors where germination will only be a few days as opposed to outside when it's hot where it will take weeks. Swiss chard is another chinopod option. Direct sowing is preferred with this plant as well as beets. One of the easiest things to grow, both indoors and in cool season conditions, are lettuces. And there are literally hundreds of lettuce varieties. Generally, they prefer germinating in about mid-70s to low-70s. They prefer to grow in 60 to 65 degree conditions. Lettuces come in a variety of forms. We have the head lettuce, iceberg being the typical one that we think of when we think of a head lettuce, romaine, and then there are lots and lots of leaf lettuces. And leaf lettuces are nice because you can cut leaves, let the plant restore itself, and it will grow back again, and you can come and cut it, 
many times. Lettuce is an easy grow. It's one of those plants that you can get kids hooked on gardening with. It's easy to grow in a sunny window. If nothing else, you can grow lettuce over the winter. There are a couple of legumes you could try. Peas, whether snap peas or snow peas, do pretty well in cool season conditions, but they do take longer to mature than if you plant them in the spring. You can try bush beans, either extending bush beans you've already planted or planting them for the fall specifically. You just need to make sure that you're using short season varieties of bush beans. And remember, they are not frost tolerant at all. So they have to be protected if you want to extend the season. Carrots are another fall season option. I would stick with the uh, carrots that mature in a shorter amount of time rather than a longer amount of time. You can harvest carrots for the greens or for the roots. The tops are pretty hardy down to about 18 Fahrenheit. I also would recommend mulching them pretty well and that'll help protect the roots from cold weather. Potatoes are typically grown in the spring but you can grow them in late summer and fall. It's just more of a challenge. With potatoes, we start with uh, seed potatoes, which are small potatoes, or you can get sprouted potatoes from your pantry or closet, whatever. Um, again, with store-bought potatoes, you wanna make sure you're going with either really old potatoes that have started to sprout or with organic ones that haven't been treated. Potatoes need to be hilled as they grow, so there's a lot more maintenance involved. You can grow potatoes in containers. In our demonstration garden, we've grown fall potatoes once. We were marginally successful. Um, this would not be my first choice if you're starting a garden uh, to do in the fall. So we've got some resources here for you. Seed tape, again, University of Florida, our Florida Extension folks have a really good uh, do-it-yourself seed tape page. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel to get information on lots of different vegetables. Um, we also have one that I highly recommend. It's Being an Observant Gardener, which was done by Master Gardener Amy Falch. That's really good on integrated pest management in the garden. And there's the Virginia Virtual Farm to Table video series which is housed in Fauquier County. Those videos are geared at showing what's being grown in the Commonwealth commercially. However, a number of those videos also include information on growing them in your backyard garden. With that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Okay, the first question is, how do I prepare soil for fall crops after summer growth? The standard extension answer is, it depends. Um, it really does depend on, on what you mean. So a lot of times if you're doing something that where you're trying to minimize tillage, you can simply remove, cut at the base and remove the old plants, um, throw on some compost, rake it in and then plant into it. If you've under or over sown, um, a lot of times you'll cut off the crop that, that you're harvesting. Hopefully you've got some sprouting going on of the, your winter crops and you can lightly dust those with uh, compost. If you're going for full bore and tilling, um, then basically you would cut down whatever you're going to cut down except for members of the tomato family um, you can incorporate those back into the soil tomatoes have a lot of diseases and it's best that you try and minimize um, putting potentially diseased plants back into the soil but you till that up really well and uh, mix some compost in the problem with tilling if you're tilling um, plants into the ground, what you're going to run into is you're going to run into a nitrogen drop for about a week 
and then it will stabilize itself as the microbes try and, and process those plants that you've turned under. In the end, it's a it's useful, but up front that really that pushes your planting date battle back a week. Another reason why starts might be a, a good option instead of seeds. Okay, next question was how do I get uh, squash bugs? Get rid of squash bugs. That is an excellent question. Um, <laughs> there is no one right answer. Um, there is no one good answer. Um, there are some chemicals you can use, but they come back. Um, a lot of times in our demonstration garden, we're doing hand picking. Um, you can use like diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is a powder that you spread that will keep the squash bugs off. The problem with that is diatomaceous powder um, will get washed off when it rains, and so it's got to be reapplied. Um, and it's not 100% effective. But it also helps with things like slugs, so bonus there. Um, and it typically is not considered harmful to most of our, our beneficials, certainly not our pollinators. But squash bugs are really difficult. Um, one of the things you can do with squash bugs is you can put a row cover on your squash and until they flower. Once they flower, you need to take the row cover off so the pollinators can get to them. Um, but you can keep the early squash bugs off using a row cover. If you decide to use an insecticide, um, let us know. We can we can give you some recommendations. You do need to be cognizant, though, that, that if you use an insecticide, that you potentially are harming pollinators, and also that most of our insecticides have a wait period between when you apply them and then when it's safe for you to actually harvest the fruit. OK, Stacy asked if we had a link or a resource on how to make your own seed tape. Um, that would be. The best one that I've seen is the University of Florida's right here. Um, I've done it with kids in the classroom. It's it's ridiculously easy to do. Um, and it, if you want neat, nice rows, it's a handy thing to have, especially if you've got small seed. Small, and I didn't mention this when I was talking about things like lettuce. The hardest thing about some of our crops, our, our fall crops, is that some of them have really tiny seeds. And so it's really hard to have those ni nice, neat rows. I will also say that if you end up having a row where you need to start spacing them out, um, it's usually better to take a small pair of scissors and cut those plants out at the intervals instead of trying to pull them. And that way you don't disturb the, the roots of the plant that you want to keep. And we had a question about, is shade cloth necessary at this point? Um, depends on where you are, but here in Northern Virginia, it does not look like it's going to be a problem. Um, shade cloth would typically be used in like July, August, and then you would take it off um, once you start getting into cooler weather where you don't really need to be protecting the plant from, from heat. Okay, the next question is, can fall vegetables be grown in containers on a deck from seed, or is it too late for this year? From seed, it's tr if, if there's, it depends on the variety. From seed, you can grow them on your deck in pots. The two issues are, do I have enough time before they mature? And things in pots, while they warm up quicker in the spring, they also cool off quicker in the winter and in the fall. So your pots are going to be, the soil is going to be more susceptible to the cold. And so you need to get those established pretty quickly. And the higher up they are, the taller your, um, your containers, the more likely you're going to run into um, potentially some 
some wind damage because the winds is the wind is going to blow and kind of suck moisture out so you've got to make sure that you're watering but if you've got them in containers and you can get them close to maturity and then bring them inside and put them under light you should be fine um, and if you use short short enough season stuff lettuce for example you should be able to plant lettuce and get a harvest easily by the 19th of october again depending on where you are in the county that could be much later as a follow-on to that what veg fall vegetables can be planted in containers um pretty much all of them really uh let's see i've done garlic and onions in in containers never tried beets before but i don't see why you couldn't do beets um pretty much all of them as long as you've got a big enough container for them chard might chard's a big plant so it might be a bit of a hassle um with some of the brassicas you need to think about spacing so it's usually one plant per um, container um, even though we see the compact head of cabbage that we get at the store if you've ever grown cabbage, you know that cabbage spreads out quite a bit and there are a lot of flat leaves before they form the head. And so you need a lot of space for that. But I can't think of, I can't think of a fall vegetable that I wouldn't grow in, in a container. Um, okay. The next question is, is it too late to plant seeds for fall? Lettuce, I would say no. For most other things, it really depends on how short of a variety, how short season of a variety that, that you have. Um, what I suggest for people is, again, find out what your average first killing frost date is and work the math backwards. Here in Prince William County, we have a wide variety of average first frost um, between the 19th and the 29th of October and that's because we are a, lo a long county and so typically if you're closer to Bull Run Mountain you're going to have an earlier frost than you would say if you were in Dumfries and also keep in mind those are averages so sometimes they can be earlier sometimes they can be late um, was it la I want to think last year our first killing frost was actually in December um, with the climate adjusting itself. Um, that first killing frost is tends to be a little bit later. Um, I would say, you know, give it a shot. see do you want to start seedlings do you want the seedlings started inside to be leggier for transplant purposes? no no you don't um you want them to be nice compact you want them to, to look like a start that you'd get at a garden center um, you want them nice and compact um, leggy plants are not good to do much of anything with except toma tomatoes. Tomatoes and tomatillos and to an extent um, potatoes have the advantage to grow roots um, from their top growth and so they can be planted deeper and all that stuff but yeah typically you would not want to have leggy plants as starts. Okay um... When should we harvest basil for this season to avoid the cold killing it? I would keep an eye on the weather. You know, if you know that the weather's going to start dropping into the 30s, whether during the day or during the night, that's when I, I would probably go with my last harvest. Um, if you've never grown basil before, think about... Um, once it starts flowering, it starts getting a little bitter. And so as soon as it starts flowering, you want to snip those off um, and that will help you extend the season until frost. Unless you're trying to 
to let it flower and save seed, in which case that can go ahead and let it flower, stick a paper, or once the flowers themselves die, stick a paper bag over the top of it, snip it, hang it upside down to dry, and it should be, uh, you should be able to harvest seed from that. Okay, the next question is, what about corn in zone 7B? Um, it depends on what we're talking about. Um, I know I'm throwing depends around quite a bit, but um, that is a, <laughs> that is something to think about. So corn does not like to be frozen. Um, actually, young corn can handle frost pretty well. Uh, but if you're talking about corn, you need to think about if you are we talking about corn that has already been planted and you know it's reaching maturity in the fall or if it's corn that we're starting from seed and want to try and get a crop in um, if you're trying to get a crop in you're probably not going to get one um, if you planted it in the summer and you're wondering how long it's going to it's going to do um, it it's probably going to, the plant itself is probably going to survive in, until the first killing frost. Um, it, it's hard to find a good short season, a good corn variety that's short enough season that you can plant in the fall and get a harvest. Because the other issue too is that even though um, you don't have to worry too much about pollen because it, or pollination because it's wind pollinated, you do have to think about corn need it needs to be a certain air temperature for corn to want to tassel it's going to need a certain air temperature for corn to want to to develop the ear even if it does get pollinated um, you can try growing short season corn for baby corn and baby corn if you're not aware it's the tiny corn that you get in typically in chinese dishes Basically, those are corn ears that have not been pollinated. And because they haven't been pollinated, the kernel's never going to develop, um, but the whole cob is edible. And so if you've got some extra corn se seed um, that's short season and you want to give it a shot, I would say go ahead. Um, a lot of our corn varieties, you're looking at at least 80 days. So it's kind of a, a gamble as to whether or not you'll get anything other than a nice decoration for Halloween. Um, the next question was, what is the difference uh, between a frost and a freeze? Um, yeah, I'm, I, off the top of my head, I can't tell you the technical difference, but generally a frost uh, is where you get a light coating of, of frost. It really, it, it's a very superficial thing. A freeze, that cold temperature is going to penetrate into the plant to the, to the point where you're going to get ice crystal formation inside the plant. And with a lot of plants that have a lot of water in them, that's going to cause the cells to erupt and that's what's going to kill them. Um, generally speaking, if you're listening to your local weather report, they're going to distinguish between a frost and a freeze. Um, they'll say, you know, bring your plants in, it's going to frost. Um, typically, once we get into the point where we have, you know, low 30s continuously, um, that's when you're into freezes. Um, a lot of times, too, the difference really is that, for example, if the temperature is supposed to get low, but it's not going to be low for very long, you're typically going to get frost. So it may drop to 19 degrees tonight. It's not going to, but for the sake of argument. If it drops to 19 degrees, but it's only in between 32 and 19 for an hour or so, that's gonna be a whole lot less damaging than if we start getting those cold temperatures starting like early in the evening and lasting till late in the morning. And that that's the, 
I guess, the unscientific way of thinking about um, the difference between the two. And we had a question, doesn't a lot of grocery store garlic come from China? Um, honestly, I don't know. It really kind of depends on your, on your grocery store. Uh, there are more and more grocery stores are looking at locally grown garlic. Um, so it, it really kind of depends on your grocery store and your supplier. You can ask. Theoretically, your produce manager will know that. Um, sometimes it's actually labeled and tagged. But I know of, for example, when I was in graduate school in Blacksburg, I knew several garlic growers that were growing garlic to be used in the New River Valley um, in actual chain supermarkets. So it really depends on, on your store and what their supply is from. The next question is, does basil turn yellow from too much rain? Uh, I'm seeing it waver between yellow and green uh, in Virginia Beach. Uh, could be a nitrogen thing. Um, it could be that they're just, it, uh, well, actually in Virginia Beach, it definitely could be a nitrogen thing. And it and too much rain could be the cause of it. If you're growing it in sand, it's really easy for that nitrogen to get leached out. That would be my, not seeing the plant, that would be my first thought. Um, but yes, if you have really excessive rain, a lot, it doesn't matter what the plant is, um, a lot of plants will yellow, at least briefly, because they can't, the other, so if there's too much rain and the roots are basically waterlogged for a period, they can't always get to nitrogen. And so that's gonna cause a temporary yellow, yellowing. Um, if they get yellow and stay yellow, then it's a, a nitrogen, or it can be a nitrogen issue where you would add fertilizer and fix the problem. Next question is, um, I'm new to all this. Can you cover your plants in the event of frost if they are not frost tolerant? And should plants be taken, uh, that can be taken inside, be taken in, or is covering enough to save them? It depends a little on the plant. Um, if we go back, There we go. Um, we go back and we take a look at, okay, well, can it survive a light frost? Typically those you can cover and it will be fine if you get into a more significant frost. And again, the difference between light, moderate, and heavy frost has to do with the amount of time that they're subjected to the colder temperatures. Um, but most of our, our, win our winter I should say fall plants, most of our fall vegetables can survive a little bit of light frost, especially if they're covered. And a lot of times just using a row cover, sometimes you can just throw a sheet over it for overnight. Um, that can work. Typically I tell people if it's a really frost sensitive plant, take it inside early and that we don't have to worry about it. Um, but a lot of times, you know, just a, a simple cover will help. It's ideal if you give that cover up off the plant. If we go back. So if you look at the frost tolerance between a row cover and a low tunnel, low tunnel is going to have more uh, frost protection because it creates a bigger pocket of air and also the actual row cover is going to get hit with the frost first and that's going to be up off the plants whereas on the row cover it potentially is going to be directly on the plant so having a structure to keep it up higher is, is better double covering it is even better but a lot of times that's not practical and sometimes instead of row cover you can just dump straw on it depending on what the plant is um, we typically use straw with onions but you can use it with other things as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, first time, I'm a first time gardener and I started out by growing my plants inside a portable greenhouse and raised beds. I'm curious as to what I need to do to prep my soil for fall 
in the same beds once I'm done harvesting this, my summer plants. So the thing with um, raised beds and greenhouses that you, it depends on whether we're talking about soil soil or we're talking about um, things like potting mix. So we typically think of, of potting mix and everything that we grow plants in as soil, but really a lot of the soil is typically in the ground and it has active biology. A lot of our potting mixes and other mediums that we use to grow things on give structure, but they're basically sterile. Um, and so in that case, what you would want to do is you would want to make sure that you replenish nutrients. Um, and so putting in a slow release fertilizer, mixing that in would be a good option. If you're dealing with actual soil soil, um, you might want to think about, well, okay, what did I have planted here? Was it a heavy nitrogen user? And if so, then I probably want a light nitrogen user. Um, and kind of rotate things around so that you can maximize that. If rotating is not an option, then you want to consider fertilizer. Um, but generally what I would suggest is once you harvest whatever you're going to harvest, um, put down some compost. If it's soil, soil. If not, you don't really need to. But um, put down your fertilizer, kind of rake that in, um, and then plant into it. Are there any specific consideration for season extension on a deck with grow bags? Uh, grow bags, that's the one. Um, so that's actually kind of interesting. Depending on the size of your grow bag, you can insulate the soil a little bit by actually putting the grow bag in a pot. Um, and then cover the plant itself. Um, I know people who have made tents of row covers or tents of sheets and put them over plants in pots whether or grow bags for that matter. Um, typically we don't, well, I take that back, we're seeing more and more grow bags being used by uh, homeowners. Um, for the longest time they were just used in industry. Um, but really if you can get the plant covered, with a sheet or something or row, uh, row cloth, um, that's what you want to do. And like I said, you can insulate the soil of it a little bit more by putting it into a large pot. You wouldn't necessarily have to pack anything around it. You're basically creating a, uh, a row cover, if you will, for the base of the plant, if that makes any sense. When you say cut them down, do you mean to cut at the stem or to pull them up from the roots? So I'm a big no-till guy, which means minimize the soil as little as possible. Um, so for me, it would be cut them at the root um, and leave the roots in there to decay and to recycle those nutrients back in. Um, that would be ideal in, in my personal view. Um, sometimes that's not always practical. Um, and again, with members of the tomato family, you pretty much want to pull those plants because again, that family tends to have lots of disease issues. And so it's better to pull those and bag those and throw them away than it is to let them stay in the soil. What should I use for a growing medium for lettuce, basil, and potatoes if growing in pots that will be outside but moving inside later? Something that's as light as possible when we're talking about potatoes. Um, regular potting mix is probably good for um, all of them except potatoes. I've never grown potatoes in potting mix, so I don't know how, how to answer that. Um, Typically, so the way that potatoes grow is typically we dig a trench, we put a potato, a start potato in, we cover that potato, we let it grow about six inches, and then we cover about two thirds of that greenery and we continue that process. Potatoes grow in a chandelier pattern, which means the lowest potato, where you 
plant that seed potato, that's as low as you're going to get potatoes. And so the more you pile on, the deeper that stack is, the more volume you have, the more potatoes you'll get. Um, you could start with soil at the bottom of your container, and then as you as it grows up, you can use straw. The straw is fairly light. It's a little bit messy when you dump it out inside, but you know um, that's manageable. Typically in the ground, as we get to a certain point, because we've dug that trunch and we've got that extra soil sitting there and we use that to fill it up. And once we run out of that, we typically use straw. Um, so straw would be a decent medium for it. Um, the tricky part with that is that I would, my biggest concern would be getting enough nutrients for it to grow well. Um, so just make sure that you're giving it a good fertilizer, um, ideally a good slow release fertilizer, because once you start uh, hilling it with straw, it's a little harder to get that fertilizer down there. And more than likely, if you're doing fall potatoes, you're going to end up with smaller, um, more like new potatoes. And if you've got other questions, feel free to email me offline and I'd be happy to have a conversation about all the different options um, and show you some videos that might be helpful. I've heard that you can add a blanket or fleece uh, over a row cover to add a layer of warmth. Is this something you've tried? It's not something that I have personally tried, but it is something that I have personally witnessed. Um, and typically when you do that, you're doing that only for a night. You're not, you're not leaving it on there because if you leave it on there, you're basically going to kill all your light and then the plant's going to die anyway. Um, but I have, so when I was in graduate school, for example, um, I was working on one of the university farms and I was dealing with row crops. Um, but the vegetable guys who were in a field next to us, we were expecting some really cold weather, and, and this was actually in the spring, and they had a row cover down, and they went out and they put blankets, um, and it's not that's not really unusual. I mean, even in the golf industry, if they're expecting really bad or really cold temperatures and they're growing warm season grasses, they will pull blankets on them and put them on overnight for that added, added um, insulation. So yeah, you can definitely do that. You just need to make sure you take them off in the morning. Uh, the next question is, how do I get female flowers to sprout on my squash? And how long will my cucumber plant last into fall? Um, let's deal with the cucumber first. Um, until it's done. Cucumbers, um, the big thing here that you're going to run into with cucumbers is going to be, at some point, the pollinators are going to go into hibernation. And that's going to be an issue. Although you can hand pollinate cucumbers with um, a Q-tip or a, a fine brush. Um, so they will last fairly long. But once, I'm trying to remember how frost sensitive they are. They're probably more frost sensitive. So I would say that if they're outside, they're probably not going to survive the first killing frost. And you may, even with light frost, you may even see some damage. With the squash question. So squashes are, are interesting plants for a whole variety of reasons. But one of the things that they typically do is they start and they put out male flowers. And then after a while, when the conditions are right, they start putting out female flowers. And so you kind of are waiting on the plant to get its act together. Now, this summer, we had an issue with lots of male flowers and very few female flowers. And a lot of that had to do with the extreme heat. The plant sensed that it wasn't good conditions for it to start flower or to start reproducing. So it held off. And then as we got into the fall, we got more and more female flowers and they could pollinate. Um, there is no thing that I, specific thing that I know of that is going to make your squash produce female uh, flowers. 
Um, you just got to give it time and let nature get uh, let nature run its course. Okay, the next question. Um, I had a variety patch of lettuce planted this spring in containers, and they did well. They finished up with the summer heat. I think they self-seeded and I have huge leaves again. Is there a way to identify them to be sure they're edible? Um, probably. I'm not sure what that is, though. Um, if you send us pictures, we can try and visually identify them. Um, typically, they're going to, I mean, if they flowered, um, you know, they bolted and flowered, typically they're going to reseed themselves. And, and it's a pretty good chance that if they look like the lettuce that you had before, that's its lettuce. But you can send us a picture. We can try and visually ID those. Um, some of them are more easy than others. Um, worst case scenario, what you would do is you would um, you would eat just a very little of it and wait and see if there was a reaction. Well, there's a whole protocol for dealing um, with unknown plants and, and tasting them and seeing if, how edible they are. Um, Typically, um, you know, in the military, we, there's a lot of training on that for survival and evasion. Um, but a lot of, of us who've been through some camping stuff and, and some outdoor stuff have gone through that as well. Um, you could get into that protocol, but I think visually you'll be able to tell. Um, but like I said, you can send us a picture and we'll try and identify it visually for you as well. In zone 9A, can I germinate indoors and then plant? I'm going to say yes. Um, I'm trying to think of where exactly zone 9A is without looking at a map. I know it's south, but other, <laughs> other than that, I'm not sure how far south. Um, I Actually, in any zone, you can, you can start stuff inside. Um, but... If the if you're in eight or nine or ten, you obviously you've got more time in terms of growing season. Um, the only tricky bit is daylight that you might run into. But yeah, I don't see any real problem with with doing things inside. Now the next question is, what can be grouped together in containers? Depends on how big the container really is. Um, lettuces are good. For, I mean, you can have a whole carpet of lettuce filling up an entire container. Um, I would say a lot of your brassicas, with the exception of radishes, um, don't do very well in containers when they're grouped together because you just crowd them too much. Um, radishes you can grow in a big gulp cup, actually. I'd, done that with students before um so you can space them pretty close together they would work well um trying to think of what else it really depends on the plant um how much in the pot how much space you're going to give them uh, i've got a i've got basil in the backyard in a container that's probably 14 inches across and i've got two basil plants and uh and at least two carnations growing in it um and, you know, they're doing fine. But, like I said, I, I would be cautious about brassicas. Um, garlic works fairly well. You can plant garlic fairly close together. Um, so garlic would work well in, in pots together. Again, it really depends on how big a pot. And as annoying as it might be to have a bunch of, of smaller, and when I'm talking about smaller, about size, I'm, I'm really talking about, um, you know, width in terms of area, so that, you, you know, for spacing. Um, a lot of times it's a little easier to have those smaller area pots that still have decent volume and bring those inside rather than have one big pot that you have to move because it's he heavy and it, um, you can get into crowding issues there too if you're not careful. 
Uh, one resource that I would um, look at if you're thinking about, oh, okay, how, how can I do this? How many plants can I have in this certain area? Um, Mel Bartholomew re wrote a book, actually a series of books uh, called Square Foot Gardening. And while Square Foot Gardening, in my experience, has not been as successful as other types of gardening, um, Mel does lay out, you know, if you've got a square foot, this is how many cabbages you would plant in it. This is how many radishes you would plant in it. Um, and that's that's a good guide point to start with. And if you're in the Prince William Library in Prince William County, the Prince William County Library System has several copies of that. Uh, the next question is, any chance cucumber seedlings can be productive if planted at this point? Again, your your big challenge is going to be um, making sure they get pollinated. There are places that grow cucumbers in greenhouses in the winter. Um, so if you can control the climate, then you can definitely grow them. The issue is going to be actually pollinating them. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of nice cucumber flowers, but you're not going to get any cucumbers. Um, how can I tell that our sweet potato crop is ready to harvest? It was planted from starters in July. Um, dig them up. Just it. So sweet potatoes are a whole different story, but sweet potatoes are a bit tricky because how big a sweet potato do you really want is the question. And so you can harvest them a little early for smaller potatoes. You can harvest them later and, you know, go into those mammoth giant ones. Um, the problem is the longer you wait, the more likely you are to get slug and, uh, and insect damage. And if it's really wet, you can get some rot issue. Typically, we plant our sweet potatoes in our demonstration garden in um, June, late June because sweet potatoes need warm ground and they need warm weather. And so we will typically harvest them sometime in September. We harvested them, some of our sweet potatoes we harvested this week, the ones in raised beds. Um, the ones that are in the ground we'll harvest next week. Um, so I would say September is probably a good time for you to, to be harvesting. Okay, the next question is um, from Suzanne. She said that she's never gardened before, but her family would like to grow a salad garden on the balcony in a raised planter, something like carrots, cucumbers, radish, lettuce, about a three foot by six foot. We have a greenhouse dome for the planter box. Do I keep that dome on all the time or should it be off for the pollinators to access for those particular plants? So I would, I would skip the cucumbers. I, I, cucumbers, especially on, a, on the deck in a planter box over the winter, I'd skip that completely. But let's see, she said lettuce and radish and what else besides cucumbers? Carrots. Carrots. Um, those can grow in the, the planter boxes. The other thing with a planter box, and, and this is true with containers too, you've got them on the deck and it's cold, or you're expecting cold weather, put them up against the house. And so some of the radiant heat from the house will help um, overnight, will help with the warmth. Um, so if you've got them in a planter box, and I can easily see growing carrots, I can easily see lettuce, definitely, um, and radishes, yeah, they should all be fine. The, the big trick is that because they're cool season plants, you have to manage the dome in, in a sense that you don't want them to bake in there. So when it's warm, take that dome off. When it's cool and they need that protection, then the dome should go on. Um, you don't have to worry about pollination for any of those things. With lettuce, you're, you're going for the leaves. With carrots, you're either going for the tops or the roots. Same thing with radishes. So none of them need to pollinate. All of them can have a... Have something over them all the time it's really a, a temperature issue more than it's a um, a pollination issue
What cover would you recommend for a small garden? What cover crop, sorry? Uh, depends on the situation. Um, the easiest cover crop to grow is cereal rye. Um, that's as close to idiot proof and not to insult anybody, but it's it, cereal rye is the easiest to deal with in terms of it has a wide variety of when you can plant it. It has a number of ways that you can deal with it in the spring. Um, that being said, it kind of depends on the situation. So cover crops, again, whole other class, but there are some cover crops that will add nitrogen. Cereal rye is not one of them. There are some cover crops that will help with holding on to what nitrogen is left over in the soil. That cereal rye will do. Um, weed suppression. Uh, there are some crops that are better at pulling up phosphorus. Kind of depends on what you're going with. Typically in our demonstration garden, we use a mix of uh, a cereal rye or sometimes oats or barley with um, some type of legume, whether it's vetch or crimson clover. We're getting to the point where it's a little bit, we're starting to get late in the season for being able to plant some of the legumes to get them mature enough to survive the winter. Um, daikon radish is another option. So daikon radish is, instead of being a normal sort of um, golf ball size root, daikon radish are long slender roots and they get thicker over time. Daikons are actually, if you've got problems with heavy clay soil, daikons are excellent for that. And typically with a daikon, what you do is you plant that, you let them get as much top growth as possible. A hard freeze comes and kills them. All of that foliage drops down and forms a mat on your garden area, which makes an excellent weed barrier. So you don't have as many weeds to deal with in the spring. Um, and meanwhile, that root rots away and the microbes just go nuts with it. And you're getting nutrients back into the soil. You're feeding your micro population. Daikons are excellent for that. And and in doing that, they break up that clay and make that soil much looser, much more friable. Um, the one thing you have to be careful about with daikons is that, and daikons sometimes will survive the winter. I actually have a daikon in my compost pile that survived the winter and the summer. So it's probably about, oh, I don't know, eight inches around. Um, it's a huge monster of a thing. But uh, the daikon is, is good for breaking up th that clay, but it also can be a trap crop for uh, harlequin bugs especially. And harlequin bugs are a pest of brassicas and other plants. Um, because daikon is a radish, it's a brassica, they're going to go to that. Um, a trap crop, for those of you who don't know, is a crop that you plant, get all of the pests to come to, and then kill all the pests all in one place. Um, daikons can be used as a trap crop, but you have to be careful because you don't want, you want it to be a trap crop in the sense that you want them to come there and kill them. You don't want it to become a breeding ground. But daikons are an excellent choice and they actually are fairly available by seed. But if you have more specific questions about cover crops, please, please email me. I'm happy to to talk about individual situations and ways to meet the needs that you have for your garden to build your soil. There's several more questions to go. Um, can kale be grown indoors, mostly to be harvested as baby kale? Yes, most of our greens can be harvested indoors that way. When is the best time to plant oregano if it flowers, can you still use the herb? Oregano is largely a perennial, um, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so yes, you can you can still use the, the, the leaves if it's flowered. I'm not sure when the best time to plant oregano is. I've always done it in the spring, and that's largely because that's when it, the starts are available. Um, But because I've never grown it from seed, so I've never actually looked at seed package for oregano. Hmm. 
I know you can transplant it in the fall. So I assume that you could you could plant it in the fall as well. Is there such thing as a solar powered heat pad or cover that can be placed in a tunnel so there is warmth at night? Sort of. So there are some heat pads that you can use. Typically, when we talk about heat pads in a horticultural situation, we're talking about putting putting them under trays where we're starting seedlings. Um, I have not seen one that is solar powered enough that's going to generate enough heat to really make a difference. Um, those heat pads also are very localized in the amount of heat that they produce. It would be difficult to um, it would difficult it would be difficult to build up enough heat to radiate it out throughout the greenhouse or coal frame. Um, the smaller amount of air that you have, the more likely that would happen. What you could do uh, the oh the other problem with solar power is of course that at night is typically when you really need the cold uh, the protection from the other things that you could do, um, you could put black plastic down underneath um, to help pull the sun in, pull that sunlight into that black. As it heats up through the day, that heat is going to go into the soil, and that soil is going to act as a bank so that at night it's slowly going to release that heat back into the air. Um, that works for actually ideally putting bricks down and painting them black. Um, bricks are excellent heat sinks for that. Basically, you want a, a, a dense material that can soak up that heat and then release it back. So um, heat pads are different. There are a number of passive heat systems that have been used in Asia for a long time. Um, that can be useful. I know people who will take uh, those plastic, those big, you know, 50 gallon plastic bins, spray paint them black, fill them with water, um, and leave them in their greenhouse so that that water again is going to soak up all that heat. And then at night, it's going to release that heat back and give you a degree or two of uh, heating from that. The next question is, what can I plant now in my raised beds? Cover crops, um, radishes, lettuce. Um, again, it depends on where you are. Um, so if anything that you have enough time to reach maturity, either by itself or with a row cover, you can plant now. The next person is, um, I am in Virginia Beach and curious why I'm having no luck growing turnips by seed. I think I may be planting at the wrong time. I want to grow both green and root. When in spring and in fall, should I plant turnip seeds in my area? Mm, let me think about that. Um, let's go. So this map is, or this chart is for Northern Virginia. It's not for Virginia Beach. Um, yeah, turnips. And so turnips, you can, up here, you can plant them as early as March 1, direct sow them. And so I would say that you could do that in Virginia Beach, um, actually even into to February, because our, We've got about a month window of when you plant turnips. So, you know, late February, early March is probably a good time. And then on the back end, you're looking at basically August into early September. So we, because you're later, um, you could September into October, you should be able to, to seed. The next one. Uh, is I want to give crops under, if you want to give crops under row cover a little extra warmth, could you put milk jugs filled with hot water under the cover at night? 
would that help? Yes, most definitely. Um, it goes back to that whole um, filling up barrels with water and and allowing them, ideally black barrels, allowing the heat to absorb through the course of the day and let that release. Um, that that is another way that you can add heat under a row cover. Although I with a row cover, because you're right on top of the plant, um, it might not be as effective as necessarily having it in a very low tunnel, but either way, it, it would help. My spinach seeds sprout in the ground and disappear in a few days. Any ideas? Um, get a dog that likes to kill rabbits and squirrels. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a lot of times when we have fresh seedlings that come up and then disappear, that's the issue. That being said, there are a couple other things that may be at play. One, if you've got a lot of organic matter in your soil and it's moist, you could have um, the roly polies will come out and eat young plants. We had a bed at our demonstration garden where we could not figure out why we put these seedlings in. They come up and then we go back two days later and it's like, where'd they go? Finally, we, we actually caught the roly polies doing it. Um, that could be an issue. Um, if the soil is too wet, then you could be getting root rots and that could be killing them. Is trench composting okay and beneficial through the winter? So for those of you who don't know, trench composting is basically you dig a trench, as the name would imply, and you put a bunch of stuff in there that you want to comp compost. So compost, for compost to work, you ideally have a mix of carbon and nitrogen, greens and browns, if you will, um, that will decompose. And you can, you can trench compost. You can trench compost over the winter. It works faster in the summer because you need you need that heat for the biology to be really active. The biology is going to be active in the winter, but it won't be as active. So you may not get things that fully compost. The other thing to consider with trench composting is that trench composting isn't necessarily going to get hot enough to kill um, weed seeds. Or certain pathogens. So you never want to put any diseased plant material into your composting. Um, but it may not kill weed seeds, just something to be aware of. Uh, but it can be really effective. Uh, I was in Afghanistan for uh, a year and when I came home I, <laughs> I had chickweed everywhere. Um, and I trench composted with chickweed and I had a bunch of lavender that had theoretically was supposed to survive the winter, but didn't. So I had a lot of those lavender flower stalks and broke them up and we trench composted all of that. And by the end of the summer, you couldn't tell we had trench composted. So um, it, it can be very effective. Um, it just may take a little bit more time. It may be instead of in spring, it may be in early summer before you actually see everything gone. But it's a good way to invigorate the, bi the biology in your soil. If I saved seeds for next year, is there anything I should do? Is there a way to test the seed for saving for the next year? So you want to keep them in a cool, dry place. You don't want them super sealed because seeds are living things and they do need some oxygen. Um, the way that you test them is basically, well, the easiest way is you take 10 of them, you put them, put them on a damp paper towel, fold the damp paper towel over top of them, Give them however long it takes that it's supposed to take them to germinate. Reveal and see how many have germinated. And that gives you a rough germination percentage. And, you know, you typically want germination percentages to be up in at least the 80s. Um, but the lower the germination percentage is, it just means the more seeds you have to put in the hole to, to get something back. Um, 
typically when you're when you're seed saving, you want those seeds to be well to feel dry to the touch. Um, you want them to be hard. You want them to to look normal. You don't want to save seeds that look abnormal. Um, and typically they're typically dark in color or what is normal for the, those seeds, depending on the plant. Um, so you want to make sure that you give them enough time to, to fully mature on the plant. Or in some cases, if they're half mature with a lot of plants, you can, uh, you can still harvest them, but you have to let them dry first. But I always find leaving them on the plants works better. The, the, the viability of the seed tends to be higher that way. The next one is I have a neighbor friendly composter. I have what appear to be blowfly larvae in the compost. Is there a trick to getting them out? Please say yes. <laughs> is there a problem for using this compost to mix with my soil with the larvae? Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, yeah, <laughs> there is an easy way, but it's not an environmentally responsible way. Um, and it would make the compost useless. Uh, that said, the larvae really aren't going to be a problem in terms of your soil. And chances are, if you till that into the soil, um, A, you could be killing some of the, the larvae in the tilling process, and B, there are things in the soil that probably will go after them as well. Typically, we get um, fly larvae in, in compost when we're decomposing things either at not the right brown and green ratio or that we put things in the compost that we really shouldn't like meats and fats. You could, if there's a lot of larva and it's late enough in the season, what you could do is you could take that compost out, spread it on top of your garden and let the weather kill those larvae before they they hatch out um, but really there there isn't there's not a good other way that I can think of that would get rid of the blowfly larva um, they will eventually hatch and go away but you know, it's not going to harden your soil what are the best vegetables to grow with only partial sun my sun faces the north the uh, sun is only in my garden space from morning until about 1 p.m. Leafy greens. Um, lettuces are good. Um, you, really want, you really want at least six hours. Uh, and leafy greens are probably the easiest to grow in lower light conditions. Um, something else jumped into my head and then left it. Um, Herbs, a lot of our herbs can handle low light. The trick with both of them is they're not going to grow as fast. And because they're not going to grow as fast, maturity is going to take a little, little bit longer. But I, I would start with lettuces. If, you, if nothing else, you should be able to grow lettuce. If you can't grow lettuce, then you don't have enough sunlight to grow anything. Vegetable-wise, probably. Getting ready to put a cover crop where we are growing sunflowers. Should those be cut with the roots left or should we pull the whole plant? I've heard sunflowers aren't good for other plants if tilled in. So I've never heard that. But um, when those mammoth sunflowers that I showed you before, oops, might be somewhere. Oh, there we go. Um, so with these guys, we had a cover crop growing, so we didn't pull them out. Uh, we just cut them at the base. If we had, if we hadn't undersown, um, that's still what we would have done. Uh, it's minimizing the soil disturbance. Um, the sunflowers themselves, it's it was easier to compost the leaves and to harvest the stalks and the flowers for other things. Uh, if you let the stalks dry, they actually make uh, pretty decent kindling. Um, and in 
Eastern Europe, they typically that's typically what the stocks are used for. But I wouldn't necessarily worry about you know cutting them down or pulling them up by the roots. I would just cut them down, and I wouldn't necessarily incorporate them into the soil because the because it's so the stems are so pithy, it would be really difficult to do that. So you're better off um, composting the leaves and and trying to figure out what you want to do with the stalks. Um, you could even compost the stalks if you cut them up, but that would be much easier than trying to till them into the ground. Uh, next question is: I have my final watermelon still growing what can i do to ensure they get to maturity in zone b uh, pg county maryland um i can't remember what the frost dates are in, in pg county um i i would say keep the plant as warm as, as possible you actually could probably keep an eye on the weather is my first bit of advice and if it looks like things are getting ugly um, in terms of temperatures, you can try and insulate them. You can try and, and throw a blanket over them overnight. You can try and cover them a lot with straw. The leaves will find a way to get out of the straw and reach for the light, but you know, then you have to cover them again. So I think a blanket is, is probably a good idea. Um, or some other row cover that's going to insulate them. But depending on, on what your watermelon is, you probably are going to be able to to get that get them to maturity. Um, if you planted watermelon in a normal um, time period for your area, then you should be good. But if it looks like we're going to get an early cold snap, I'd throw a blanket over the plant just to insulate it and protect it. I've got sweet potatoes in a large pot for the first time. When do I harvest and are they frost tolerant? The pot is on my deck. Um, sweet potatoes are not going to be frost. Well, they might be able to handle a light frost, but you, you're you not going to want them. They're, they're not going to do well in cold weather. They are definitely a hot plant. Um, they need that hot weather. So the problem with growing sweet potatoes in containers is that as the vine goes on, they drop basically roots and they they form those those sweet potatoes. Um, so the longer they the longer the run they have in soil, the more sweet potatoes you're going to have. So in the pot, you're probably not going to have quite as many as you think you otherwise would be. Um, typically, we do see sweet potatoes in pots, but used as an ornamental um, for hanging pots in that fashion. I would go ahead and harvest your sweet potatoes now, um, but not knowing where you are in the country, um, it's hard to say exactly, but if you're basically, if you're in Virginia, Maryland, DC, now's about the time you'd want to harvest sweet potatoes anyway. I had tomatoes that didn't produce many leaves or large tomatoes, just tiny ones. The same with peppers, very tiny. I live on Bull Run Mountain in a cleared area, but still some trees on the outer edge. That almost sounds like uh, sounds like a shade issue. I would I would double check how much shade you have during the day. That being said, this year has been an awful year um, for tomatoes in particular, but to a lesser extent, um, some of our sweet peppers. And part of that is because even though they are warm season plants, you reach a certain temperature on both of them and they will stop flowering. And if they have fruit, that fruit will stop maturing. And it will wait for things to cool down and then it will start going again. Um, and so we had a lot of tomatoes and a lot of peppers that were stunted really badly over the summer. And that could be part of the issue. But sunlight definitely could be part of the issue as well. I would try and get an idea, you know, how much sun you're actually getting. You know, double check to see, you know, how long, how what your day length period is. 
tomatoes and that that whole family needs needs more sun than a lot of other plants so you want something at least eight but ideally like 10 or 12 during uh, the height of the summer you're never going to get to 12 where we are but you know something something in double digits would be ideal for tomatoes if you could get that next question is can i keep my rosemary outside all year round yes in most years um and when i'm talking about rose well let me back up for a minute rosemary in the ground nine out of ten years is going to survive and again we're talking northern virginia the northern virginia winters every now and again we got a really severe wind winter and it's going to kill rosemary um i had a lovely rosemary hedge that was killed several years ago um that had lived for i don't know 15 years it had done fine and then we got a bad winter and boom uh but if it's in a pot, then it's a little bit more tricky because again, with a pot, you don't have the rest of the soil to insulate it. And so the roots can get frozen and that will kill it. Um, I have never seen anyone successfully have rosemary in pots over winter in this area. The next question is, um, we'll be putting strawberry bare roots in railing planters how do you protect for the winter do they need to be protected for the winter it's first time for growing strawberries for me sweet charlie variety hmm. so again i'm going to assume we're in northern virginia that we're talking about um strawberry bear yeah strawberries are actually arctic plants or subarctic plants so they're pretty cold tolerant um, if you've noticed the wild strawberries in your yard, uh, in your yard, you'll know that they will survive the winter. Um, putting them in planters, again, you don't have the soil as insulation, um, or as much soil as insulation. I'm not really sure of the answer to that question. I would think that they would be okay, but you might want to cover them. If it's going to get really, really cold, um, having them up against the house would be much preferable to having them like on the ed edge of the deck um, where they're more susceptible to wind and, and the weather. But that's a, I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to I'd have to have a chat with the folks at Virginia State. Um, they're berry experts to. To be able to answer that more intelligently if you send me an email we'll research it and we'll get back to you um are most herbs better to grow indoors in the winter and outdoors in the spring and summer and why did my cucumbers turn all yellow and orange um let's talk about herbs first so i don't necessarily think that that herbs grow better indoors. Um, if we're talking about annual herbs and bringing them indoors, yeah, that's that's something to consider. But most of our perennial herbs, I would leave them in the ground outside. They do just fine. That minimal soil disturbance. Um, you know, if you think of things like rosemary and some of the other uh, perennials, having them in the soil outside they're gathering energy from the sun and they're using some of that energy for themselves but they're also transplanting or translocating a lot of that energy into the soil for the microbial population and that builds your soil and it makes both the soil in general and the plants themselves much more healthy so i would not bring them indoors unless i absolutely had to so the cucumber question depends a I assume they're talking about the whole plant, cucumbers and all. Um, that sounds like a virus issue, but not being able to actually see the plant itself, I couldn't tell you one way or the other. Um, if you send us pictures, we can try and diagnose it and get some more information from you and, and make a more accurate uh, diagnosis and make better suggestions. 
Um, how long does it take to create compost in a compost bin that I can use on plants and raised beds? Again, it depends. Um, so when you're doing compost, um, well, the fastest method of compost is what we refer to as hot compost. And hot compost needs the right ratio of carbon to nitrogen. It needs adequate moisture. It needs adequate oxygen, which in a lot of cases means it has to be turned. It has to be at uh, certain temperatures, which means it has to have enough mass in order to hold those temperatures. And typically we're talking about a three by three by three cube, if you will, of, of compost. Um, and hot composting is can be you know a couple months, but it's a lot more difficult to do than what we refer to as cold composting. And cold composting is basically, oh, I've got this material, I'm gonna throw it on the pile. And I might turn that pile occasionally, but I'm gonna throw it on the pile and eventually it'll break down. Cold composting takes much longer. Um, if you are active in turning those cold compost piles and making sure that it stays moist but not uh, saturated, you can probably get by in a season or two to turn a lot of that. You won't turn all of it, but you'll turn a lot of that material into a usable compost. The issue becomes, again, when you hit winter time, it slows down the process greatly because the biology is not as active. So it's really hard to tell you specifically, oh, it'll take three days, oh, it'll take 120 days, you know, um, exact numbers in, in terms of how long it will take you to compost. And it depends on the style of compost you're doing, and it depends on, on really on the weather. We have a number of lovely publications uh, on composting that can tell you way more about composting than you probably really want to know. Um, they are on our Prince William County website, but if you can't find them, send us an email. We're happy to, to send them to you. And if you have more specific questions about co compost in your particular situation, give me an email and I'll walk you through it. Can you explain the difference in using cow manure versus horse manure? Nutritionally, they're a little bit different. Um, Trying to remember what the new. Well, it varies. The nutrient analysis varies animal to animal and what they're being fed. So we'll skip that. But um, cow, there really isn't a whole lot of difference other than cow manure tends to be a little wetter. Um, in both cases, you do have to know your source. And the reason I say that is that there are a number of herbicides that are fine to use on pastures and on hay fields that have a very long persistence. The animal can eat that particular plant that's had that herbicide sprayed on it, ingest it, doesn't hurt the, the, the animal, it just passes through the system into the manure. And if you go and you take that manure and then you turn around and you use that manure in your garden, it could kill all of the plants in your garden. Um, I will say we've had that problem more with horse manure than we have with, with cow manure in Northern Virginia, but it's something to be aware of. Um, it's always best to use well composted manure in any event, um, whether it's cow, horse, chicken, whatever. Alpaca is the only one that you can use directly from the animal onto your garden without risking burning it from nitrogen. Um, but in both cases, you want well compost, well composted manure. You want um, manure from a source that you know that you can ask, hey, what herbicides have you used on the, on their feed? Um, that's that's my advice with that. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they're asking in terms of the difference, one versus the other. But again, if you have a more if you could be more specific I'm happy to have that discussion just send me an email um, 
I think this is the last one. I bought a Pakistan mulberry bush seedling from a greenhouse in July. It is about 18 inches tall and the bottom leaves are starting to yellow. I already moved it to a larger pot once it, as it grows. Can it be saved and when should I plant it in the ground? And this is from Northern Virginia. So mul it was a mulberry, correct? Yes, Pakistan mulberry bush. I'm not sure what a Pakistan mulberry is. I will just say that. I'm going to speak in, in terms of mulberries in general. Um, so, mul well, the red mulberries is, is, is it red or black? Yeah, one of the, one of the, the mulberries is native to Virginia. But typically with, with trees and shrubs, we want to plant them in the fall into the ground. So that's not an issue. Because they're deciduous plants, it could be that they're turning yellow and dropping off because it's that time of year. Um, if you can send us pictures of the plant and the leaves up close, we can try and make a better diagnosis, but it could just be it's that time of the year. And so I wouldn't panic just quite yet, but uh, like I said, send us pictures and we're, we'll be happy to try and diagnose it for you. Well, there's one last question. Can I grow pumpkins in a pot? <laughs> Theoretically, yes. Um, will you actually get pumpkins from that? I'm not sure. The way that pumpkins grow is, you know, you plant the seed, the seed comes up, vines. And as the vines go along, they drop roots. And so you're getting nutrients from the base of the plant, and all along the, the vine. And I don't. if you put them in a pot, you basically have the pot as all the nutrients. Um, I think your best option, if you're going to try and grow them in a pot, um, you're never going to stop them from running. So you, you have to be cognizant of that. But you, I would go with a small pumpkin, and I would, as the pumpkin starts to um, vine, I would trim it so that there's one vine and I would try and, and pinch the head of that vine so once it gets a certain length so that it's not growing and growing and growing. Um, and every time a new it tries to form a new shoot off of it, pinch it off. But then once you actually get get the flowers going and you get a pumpkin or two that have started, pinch off all the other flowers. Because you've got a limited nutrient base, you want, you don't want it making flowers, you don't want it making excess vines, you want to concentrate on that pumpkin or two. Um, that's your, your most likely scenario where you're going to get success growing in a pot. And hopefully you're growing this in the summer because they are a warm season. I would not try this in the winter or even in a greenhouse. Okay, I think that was the last question. Uh, hopefully I got everyone's questions. If you have another question, you can email mastergardener at pwcgov.org and we'll be happy to answer the questions for you. Thanks, Christina. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming. I know we ran, wow, we ran really late, um, but I'm happy to answer questions. If we didn't get to a question, as Christina said, email us. We're happy to answer those questions. If we didn't answer a question in enough detail, same sort of thing. If you have other suggestions for different classes, please let us know. Thank you all for coming. Next week, we're going to be talking about lawn weeds, and we will see you then. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.